everybody. It's, I normally say it's Thursday and that's how I know uh, it's the start of it, but today it's not Thursday. I hope it's working. I've gone live. It seems to be working. It is working. Amazing. Hi everybody. It's great to see you all here. Um, so today I thought I'd try something a little bit different. I get a bunch of questions about things and loads of them I try to answer in the videos. Um, but I thought it would be really fun to do like a bit of a live Q&A, a sort of a live lesson for anyone that wants to. So I hope you're sitting comfortably, grab your hand pan if you want or a cup of tea and we'll have a little chat through. So if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat. Uh, and I'll start off with a question that I saw coming from Sue, although it's now disappeared. So if I... If you'd like to re-ask your question, Sue, I can't see it for some reason, but what you did ask me was all about hand pan maintenance. Uh, great question. So we have these giant lumps of metal in our houses. How do we look after them? How do we keep them safe? Um, and all those sorts of things. So the obvious things like storage, um, making sure that we keep them up away from any cats or children or things that are likely to kind of fall onto them. So there's a few different ways of doing that. There are, oh, you can see the wonderful Amy Naylor. Uh, her, she's got shelves, got similar shelves like that. Um, and it's really nice if you can to just raise the very, very bottom, the goo slightly up off of the, off the shelf. So you get a bit of airflow through. Um, or other people have wall mounts where you're holding them with a clip from the back or in the middle. Hello, welcome, welcome. Uh, they're also good. They make me feel a bit nervous. Like, I just don't understand how hanging the whole weight of the hand pan from the hand pan is not bad for it. But I am reliably informed that it's OK. So that is a, another another way of doing it. Generally, you want to make sure that you're not storing them inside of like a case or anything that's closed. You want to get a bit of airflow around. And then, Sue, I just remembered your question, spoke about playing hand pan with um, sun cream or moisturiser on your hands. This is uh, <laughs> one thing else that we can do to look after our hand pan. Make sure your hands are clean. Um, so clean and dry before you sit down to play. It's just going to really help if you think about all the dust and the grime and the lotions that are on there. They're not going to do us very well to sit on our hand pan. And then if you have oil, so you might have Phoenix oil or Frog Lube uh, or various different oils you don't need to be putting the oil on too often but you do need to be cleaning it so making sure you're wiping it down after you play and making sure that you use um there's some isopropyl al alcohol so alcohol there's an isopropyl that you can buy and rubbing that down every how often do you play how often is a piece of string maybe you clean it every kind of month or couple of months that's that's great and then oil it after that so that is hand pan care and maintenance. Hi to everyone just joining. Say hello. Let me know how your week is starting off and what hand pan questions you have. How do you figure out covers so quickly? <laughs> um, and keep them coming, those questions and those wonderings. It's lovely to see them. I love playing covers. As you may know, I've just today I've just been in a in a hospital and playing some lovely songs um, and in that moment people were kind of asking me questions that they wanted to hear songs and I was trying to work them out and play for them so there's a few things the first thing is knowing your hand pan really well so you want to kind of know how those notes are going to sound <laughs> your instrument is a second tip for being good at covers is make sure you've got an instrument with a helpful range some notes some instruments like a hand pan have loads and loads i'm an isa by it's got a lot of notes and i'm even doubly cheating with my underneath notes which helps others like a curd have a lot of notes from a kind of major or minor scale some like a pygmy are a bit tougher to have all of those notes on that you need um but I like to just listen to that tune and work out how the tune goes in my head. So one that someone requested was. And I'm like, okay, I've got that bit. You are my sunshine, walking up and then back down. Da -da -da -da. And so much of tunes, so much melody writing is just walking up the stairs, walking back down. 
that's the opening of You Are My Sunshine. So having a little practice, sometimes when you're playing your handpan, you might be like, oh, that sounds a bit like a song that I know. And that's a really great place to start because there's such a limited amount of melodies and tunes that we often hear ourselves using the same ones and bringing them around. So working out the tune of it, I'm literally just thinking, does it go up? Does it go down? And is it in steps or jumps? Often when someone asks me if I know a song and I don't know it, you'll hear me play a note that's similar but it's not quite right. So I might... I know it goes up. Happy. It could be. But I'm like, oh, that's not quite right. So it's literally just playing it, listening to it and guessing if it's going up or down. And then I made a video recently about the four most important chords in music. <laughs> um, I know people are sometimes really scared of harmony and they're like, oh, there's too much harmony. I don't know. Don't be scared of harmony. It just tells you what your ears already know. So you really only need to know one or two chords to be able to do a lot of covers. And that is chord one. You are my sunshine, and I'm still sitting on that same chord. I know I'm going to a new chord here. So that was just a bit of practice of listening to different chords. But as long as you can play your chord one, which is the main note, the ding. And once you've learned that, you know how to play all of the notes in that chord. Have a little look, have a practice and find your chord five. That's for me on my use of bias B. And find your chord four is A. And once you know those chords, you can play most songs. And if you want to challenge yourself, add in one more chord, that's that minor chord. Chord six. So once you know chord one, chord four, chord five, chord six. One. you have these four puzzle pieces that you can start to put together in any order and it really is like 50 percent of the songs or whatever have some combination of those of those chords so if you start if i start to cycle these chords around you'll be like um i know that song i know that song so Those same five, the same four chords, I could play them in a slightly different order and that would give a different feeling. have a song that uses a chord that isn't that and that's okay but for so 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 many songs and when I'm trying to find the the chords for a new song I'll be checking is it one of those so I hear, hear this first note um, you are my sun that you are my sunshine I'm gonna first try chord one you are my sunshine and that actually feels really right I might have tried this chord you are but do you hear that kind of clash well, that's not quite the right chord. Okay, how about this one? You are my son. Will you hear this clash? So just from those chords, those four chords, I can go through my list and be like, oh, that's going to sound good. You are my son. And that's how I went about it. Uh, so that's a little whistle stop tour through chords and through covers. Uh, sometimes I look up the covers, like I look up the chords. So stuff like Ultimate Guitar is a super useful website. Someone else has done all the hard work for you. If the kind of the ear training bit sounds a bit 
scary. You don't need to know what's good and what's right. You can check it out. Um, other people have done it online. Or if you know how to read music, that's another option. But yeah, uh, having a go, trying it out, and just trying a bunch of things that sound wrong until I finally find one that sounds right. <laughs> hope that helps with that question good question keep those questions coming by the way this is brilliant i really love it <laughs> i'm not cleaning often enough <laughs> it's like life lovely question okay how long does it take you to compose a musical piece i have lots of little sketched notes but i have trouble connecting them together into something longer yeah it's that's a good question okay so that's two questions how long does it take me to compose a piece <laughs> uh, i wouldn't say that I would ever think that any of my pieces are finished. I just like stop working on them at some point. <laughs> so for me, actually having deadlines and goals is so helpful. Like knowing that I'm going to compose a piece for a video. I've been doing a, a song every month. Knowing that I have a set deadline has really helped me because it's that little, like you, you always want to make like one more small tweak or you can always tinker with it a little bit more. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm ever finished composing. But generally, it comes out in a, in a few fits and spurs. I like using a kind of verse and chorus structure. That's really helpful. So I've got an idea like in May, I just did, I had. I've got a melody, a reasonable melody, and I've just slotted some chords under it. Actually, pretty much some of the same chords that I was talking about earlier. Cool. <laughs> My first little sketch or stretch of notes a tune and then the best thing the really the best thing that you can do in writing a verse is just do the same tune again <laughs> okay i did a slightly different tune but it's really a similar shape the chords are a little bit different but it means that i have a kind of question and answer for my verse which sounds like So I've got that little thing, literally just by pretty much doubling it, I've got a slightly larger chunk. And then I'm like, that was fun. I just do it again twice. So now I've got one verse, one sort of bite, a chunk of music, or maybe that's the chorus, I don't know. And that's my kind of glue. In fact, that is the chorus, because a chorus should be catchy, a chorus should be the hook that repeats. And then I kind of have my verse, which I can use for like storytelling. So in this case, I wanted to take that same idea, that same tune, basically use some sad chords on it. So you have to see how it shares same shape I'm kind of like imagining that my music is written like this and now instead of doubling it that way I'm trying to find ways to double it like this way or that way so instead of starting here I just moved it down here so that could be my first variation uh, I love thinking of a song structure as like a sandwich so like you've got your bread and then you've got your filling and then you've got another bit of bread and you've got a different filling. Another bit of bread, you've got a different filling. You've got another bit of bread and then you've got a massive sandwich. So if my chorus is my first bit of bread, that cheerful bit. My first filling is like maybe a little spooky repetition. And then I'm going to go back to my verse again. And I think one thing that players often struggle with is enough repetition. And I really think that there isn't enough repetition. <laughs> so you have an idea for a song, for a song. It, you've heard that idea a thousand times or 20 times, however many times you're practicing it. But for the audience, it's like, oh, okay, this is the first time. And they wanna hear it again. They wanna make sure they understand that point. So yeah, just directly copying is a really, really great tip. Then I might uh, choose another little sketch of notes, another idea. So in that song, I wanted to do a little bass line thing. So I took the same chords. I 
just played it low. And um, so using that other end, I had just been high. So I love to think in composition in terms of opposites. So fast and slow, high and low, spiky and smooth. Uh, I've just been high. I've been writing high, my melody. So I want to take these down. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can we see these patterns from the top down? Such a good question. I forget the capabilities of this studio. So this is my isabai thinking about this idea. And then I went to a baseline bit using, and I know I'm cheating, I've got these underneath notes, uh, but that's another option. And then thinking about how to slot these together. So I've got one variation as my first verse, another variation as my next verse, then trying to use some like dynamic contrasts as well. So I might have a breakdown where I just play the, the verse or the chorus, one section. Quieter, slower. louder so yeah so in terms of how long it takes me to compose a musical piece there is no end to a point of string but I think the, the idea you have a lot of ideas zoning in on one that's catchy that you keep humming and playing it in different versions if your pattern is a really simple exercise that's my first tune let's say I'm going to literally play that Because they're the same shape, they feel related. So I could go even further if I wanted. So I can take the same shape, move down, move up. And it means that you really build um, a, a cohesive melody coherent melody so take your ideas and delve into each one and get as much as you can out of that making those very small changes or even again if i go back to this example i could put a harmony to it and i move the harmony this is the harmony all i'm doing is moving this starts to feel something so I guess my answer about composing a musical piece is it's not always throwing more and more things at it it's varying what you've got I hope that's helpful. I can't stop spinning in this chair. I should. It's very disorientating and dizzying. Uh, yeah, I hope that's helpful. Um, keep on asking more specific questions if you have anything else that you'd like to know or be helped with. But generally, less is more. <laughs> Apart from when it comes to tweaking a piece. At some point, you just have to let it go. <laughs> Record it, send it off, it's done. <laughs> Well, this is a good question. What should be a good practice routine? That's such a good question. Um, the answer is there is no answer, but having a few things in your mind is really helpful. So knowing if, you've, if you're practicing for a specific goal, that's one thing, and finding a balance between specific practice and general practice. 
So I know that I have a concert coming up in a couple of weeks, a hand pan, a solo, solo concert. So that is always going to be in my mind while I'm practicing. I'm going to be building up bits of repertoire, working on those things. Uh, but I need to always balance that with bits of technical practice. So maybe playing along with a metronome or building up kind of skills and movements. Uh, and I want to balance that as well with having fun and noodling around and playing on the instrument. So I often find students come to me and they're only doing one of those three things. They're either playing other people's music, repertoire building, they're either sitting down and just playing completely freely, or they're only doing drills and technical exercises and following videos and working on the nitty gritty. And any one of those things by themselves can only take you so far. What you need is to have a combination of all three of those things. So a really good way to work that together is by starting getting your technical stuff done in a bit of a warm up. So however long you have, I want to be taking, if I have an hour, I want to be doing about 10 minutes of a warm up, uh, moving around, getting a bit of the blood moving around, getting a bit of movement in the fingers and the shoulders and stuff. It's so easy. Playing handpan is so fun. <laughs> it's so easy to just sit here and prawn over the instrument and, uh, you know, end up sitting playing for an hour or so sometimes, you know, if no one comes to interrupt you, why would you stop? And then realize that all oh, my leg and my arm and my neck and my back are feeling all funny. So making sure that you have a bit of a warm up and you move your body around before you sit down and play is really important. Even if it's just as much as a little shoulder shrug, it's a great way to get started. And then making sure that you are um, warmed up, sitting comfortably, that can be your technical warm up. I love to do a bit of metronome practice, just playing up and down the scale. I'll show you with a metronome. I can do that. Don't forget to use the overhead camera. So I've got my metronome. And I'm just playing. Can you hear that click? Hopefully you can. As simple as that. slower time of just connecting with the instrument to get me warmed up to get me really listening to the sound I often have students that are like well I can easily play at 60 beats a minute so should I just start at 100 I'm like no starting at a pace that's slow for you whatever that number is means that you're really going to zone in and connect and warm up and get your playing linked together um, and whatever you're working on so if you're working on doubles or or split hand technique try to use a bit of that in your warm-up uh, I also love to uh, build up through the, the pyramid of time. I find that super fun. Um, if you don't know what that means, I've got a video on it, but broadly breaking up our beat into more and more divisions. So here's my click. I'm gonna break that click up into two. And I can break that click up into three. etc etc and I find that those exercises that really get me thinking in about how those beats are how they're broken up and how they're fit together are really helpful I also like to do a few chords I'm going to grab the D curd actually if you have a D curd on your lap this is for you so I talk a lot about harmony so I love to play just through a few chords. And if you have a metronome there, all the better. So my chord one, my D major. Let's go to chord five, A. Thank you. 
And that's really a nice way of getting a bit of metronome practice in, a little bit of harmony practice in. And that starts to lend itself to some free noodling around. I can set up a bit of a framework and open that out to have some fun in it. So now I know I'm going to play four beats on each of those chords. I can put in a few passing modes. Two, three, D. Right, let's do two bars. Then to A. So that kind of two chord practice is super duper fun. Or I could do it with any other two chords. I chose one and five, but you might choose some different chords. And even I've done things, I've rolled a dice, I've done it completely randomly. But finding a little bit of framework and a little bit of structure from that warm up leads into that noodling and that playing. And often there are students that say, I just want to sit down and play and make music. And that is totally great. And I think we all come to music because we love it. We come because we hear something that stirs something in us or we want to join up with people and like co-create music together. So playing and enjoying it has to always be at the core of your practice routine. Like I, I hesitate to say it's practice because it should be so joyful. Um, but having a bit more structure. So I might say to myself, right, I've been learning um, a certain rhythm. So I want to play, make sure that my noodling is in that rhythm. <laughs> say I'm doing that rhythm and those chords. And I find that's a really useful um, way of jumping off into composition as well. So the improvising is free and I'm having lots of different ideas. So sometimes I'm just noodling around and I'm like, oh, this is genius. So then I hit record on my phone or, you know, whatever. It doesn't have to be this fancy overhead technique uh, camera. But I like to hit record so I can re remember it uh, and come back and play it. And then taking these little ideas, these fragments, is what is my jumping off point for then my next my next idea, my next melody. So like when I do my live streams and people give me words, I'm, I'm basically just collecting ideas for my next pieces because those inspirations it's often the first step that's so hard in composing so once you have that first step maybe that's a rhythm maybe that's a set of chords maybe that is a melody you can go anywhere with that so then so there's warm-up there's sort of technical exercises there is noodling and having a lovely time but there's also repertoire so this is once a song exists either you've written it or it's a cover or it's another handband player that you're learning, um, then you're practicing that. And I think that's really important too, because when our brain is coming up with new things, always new, new, we don't get to focus in on that detail, those dynamics, that uh, quality of touch in that same way. So having a piece that you're brushing up and working together and getting ready for performance is a really, really important thing too. Whether or not you're ready for a, a massive show, I think everyone is ready to perform. And I've been really trying to get that going. Uh, at the moment, I'm making some videos about performance and having space and time to perform because I think it's so easy for people to be like, no, I'm scared, I don't want to perform, I don't want to share my music, which I understand. But there are lovely places and spaces because as soon as you do share it, that music is existing between us. So I've made, uh, I've got a little handpan group um, on Facebook, handpan fundamentals group. So if anyone wants to share their music in there, they're totally welcome to. That's going to be a really safe space. But I'm also using a hashtag. So if you use the hashtag Hampan SOS in a little, you know, a short clip of you playing or whatever, then I, if I see it and I can see it and I can give some specific feedback. And I want to also get us improving our, 
our understanding and our, our critical listening. So there's kind of two things going on there. If you want to share your music and just be brave and bold and share it, that's amazing. There's a space for that. And if you want to share your music and get some tips um, and some improvements, still in a lovely, constructive way, do use that hashtag. And then, um, yeah, we can all just grow together and keep sharing and stuff because I love sharing music and I would hate for anyone to not share music because they're scared. So let's make the world a more joyful place that encourages each other to share and that. Cool, cool. Right. Is there any affordable recording equipment you recommend for performing or recording over Zoom? Yeah, so I've got a, a pair of Roland um, uh, little microphones. They're pretty good. I think uh, also really good is... This bad boy, uh, which actually is called a Zoom, uh, which is really nice. Um, and that's a really portable microphone, so that's handy for a lot of things, taking it out and about. And you can get various different models and makes of those. In terms of cameras and visuals, I've just got um, a, little, a little Logitech camera, which is a webcam, and I find that's really useful. Uh, but there's a lot more high end, high spec things that you can use as well. Um, I don't have them myself, but they are handy. And it depends what kind of things you want to do where you're trying to perform and share your music. But yeah, good question. I think just just things <laughs> start a very good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, the most important thing is good, good having some good audio equipment that you can record yourself with so yeah i really i really rate that zoom that's really useful and it's like one thing it's battery powered you can take it out and about or you can use it indoors and you can plug it in so yeah various various things like that awesome okay cool so i got some questions in earlier as well Oh yeah, okay. Exercises for <laughs> exercises for the left hand. <laughs> so this is something that I've wanted to talk about for a while, um, and it's something that so I went to a music college. Something that we did invented. I don't know. Left hand awareness week, and this is really we should rename it non dominant hand awareness week. But basically, I was thinking we were thinking about how you do so much stuff with your right hand, you know, like you drink a cup of tea, like brushing your teeth, you're writing. And this right hand is inevitably going to be stronger than my left hand because left hand is just like, you know, flailing along. Like we've all, I'm sure, experienced it when we're playing. You know, right hand's like, you know, left hand is just like. So getting that hand to hand kind of um, balance is so difficult because your right hand is just like, wee. So uh, a few things, um, try left hand awareness week. It doesn't have to be a week and it doesn't have to be a left hand if you're left handed. But just doing a few little tasks like brushing your teeth <laughs> with your left hand. You have to do it over the sink, otherwise it goes everywhere. Um, or like trying to eat a bit of soup and stuff. I don't know anyone that's um, like broken a hand, broken their dominant hand or anything and has had to use the other hand. It does so much interesting stuff like rewiring your brain, just thinking about using that less dominant hand so left hand awareness week non-dominant hand awareness week and then also thinking about when you start and finish um hand to hand things so if i have a little a small little roll figure i'm looking at one two three four one starting it and ending it with my dominant hand that's very normal so my right hand is playing da, da, da. finding ways to practice just starting and ending is such an important one so i pop on my metronome and practicing starting everything with the left hand. And as you extend that little roll 
section, the the, the pre section. You can start to hear that maybe your right hand is moving, your left hand's barely moving. So I like to call it monkey see, monkey do. Pause, get that left hand to start the roll. And that way your right hand is copying your left hand. So left hand should be. And when I'm doing this, I'm really focusing on the sound of my hands. Which one's louder? How are they moving? How am I sitting? Are they relaxed? And stop. And then make sure you're starting with the left again. Go left. attention slips I'll automatically go back to that right hand being on the beat but using that opposite trying to find the the left hand as the lead is really important it's just that back to that awareness of the other hand making sure that both hands are important and both hands are moving and working uh, yeah and it also puts that emphasis on the other side as well so we're not just like used to ba, 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 da, 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 da. you often hear this kind of like want that balance. So listening in and making sure your left hand is moving to the same height and in the same direction as the right hand. Ooh, good. Any tips for deciding chord progressions? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a few, there's a few things to think about. You can do the kind of, it's really useful, like so many things to learn some rules and then you can decide if you want to break them. So we have those chords. We've got one and four and five that we said already that sounds so nice. So our one, our five. Always going to sound quite nice. There's sort of certain chords that are generally going to sound really nice together. So we can use them if we want to. But then there's also any chord, a chord can be any set of notes that are played together. Like technically, this is a chord because it's more than one note played at the same time. It's not what we really understand a chord to be, but it is. So using your ears is a really good way. I like to use my ears first often, hear what sounds good, and then write down what those chords are, what those numbers are. What are those numbers? To answer the second part of the question. <laughs> so I use a kind of functional, a harmony system of naming the chords. And the way that I go through it, I'll use this D curd as an example. So on a on any ham pam, we have a limited number of notes. We've got, you know, let's say nine. Um, but that is not all of the notes of that scale. So we've got our D minor scale. And that's a scale that we're really used to hearing. But how do I find that? So firstly, you gotta write out all of the notes on your ham pam. So if you need to check your maker's notes uh, or any of those things, or you can use a keyboard or you can use an ear training tuning app, any of those ways, but finding out all of the notes that are on your ham pam. So I know for me, the D gird has a D, an E, an F, a G. It's got two A's, a B flat, two C's, two D's. So I take all of my notes and they're written out in this order around the around the circle. Which is super awesome and it's super great to know and it sounds really nice. And any D, any curve is gonna have that. But for harmony, it's not so important, it's not so useful. 
So we rewrite our notes of our D curd in order. So D, E, F, and I'm just going in alphabetical order. There's nothing special to it. D, E, F, G, A, B. And you'll notice that I said B flat, not B. It doesn't really matter too much if it's a flat or it's a natural or it's a sharp. Um, because your hand pan should only have one of each of those notes on it's just like a kind of a modifier um it's just a way that we um we number them we name them so generally i tell people not to worry too much if it's a flat or a sharp for now it doesn't matter there's more theory i will do more i'm doing more theory videos um so i will do more of them that explain it in more detail for people that want to know but for people that don't want to know it doesn't matter it's just cool to be flat that's, that's what it is B flat, C, D. So I've got all my notes on my handband. Uh, and then I'm writing them out in order. So that means that the chord of D is one. The chord of two is E. The chord of three is F. The chord of four is G. And I'm just literally calling it what that number that letter is. So G was the fourth note, so G is the fourth chord. A is the fifth note, so it's the fifth chord. And we go up like that, and that means that when I say one, four, five, that is going to be the same on different hand pads. I don't have to say, you know, D, A, G, because someone else might be numbering. If you have a C sharp chord, you'll have the same relationship between the notes. You'll still have your chord one, chord two, chord three, but I can't tell you which notes are in that because I might not know which hand pan you have. So when I'm talking about numbers, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the chords and the harmony. But don't worry about harmony and chords. If it feels overwhelming, remember, it always just shows you what your ears already know. So our ears can say that this sounds nice. And I can tell you what those two chords are, but it's only reaffirming what our ears know from years of listening to music, pop music, classical music, whatever. Here we go. All right. All right, Barry. Is it possible to do the slur note right, right, or left, left of a Ratamacu rudiment? So, um, great question. Those of uh, some people may know. It actually, yeah, it's actually part of a really good big question. So the the big answer for that is using rudiments. Um, our hand pans have only been around for like what twenty ish years. So we don't have this history, this pedagogy of teaching. So it's really useful to look around for other inspirations of teaching. So this, uh, the rudiments come from snare drawing. It, they used to be used, they'd have, um, it was used in the military to make calls, to make, you know, you'd be like, da, 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 attack from the left. And then someone else would be like, no, I don't want to, but I don't do. And I don't know what means what, but those different uh, like rhythms would have used, would have meant different things. And they were communicated through like the sound of what they sounded like. But these people in the wars, they weren't like necessarily reading music. You know, so there are different ways of using your right and your left hand to get different things. So using those different rudiments is really a really great way of practicing. So you might have heard of the paradiddle, uh, which is something that you can use all over the handpan. of borrowing bits of rudiments are a really great way of um, grooving up our playing. So the Ratama Q is, is right, right, left, da, da, da. Ratama Q, Ratama Q. And then you have a double Ratama Q, which is a rat, a Ratama Q. And my favorite, one of my favorite rudiments is the triple Ratama Q. Rat, rat, Ratama Q, rat, rat, Ratama Q. And these funny sounds, these are just ways of reminding us how to use our hands. So I guess what you're asking is about how to play quicker with one hand. So sometimes we don't want to get both of our hands over to play. So doubles is a great way of just 
speeding up, getting to play twice as fast. grace note or a flam we always want our main note to be on the beat without that first finger the second finger is falling on the beat here's the beat and i'm just dropping in before it So without that little grace note, it's literally just, I'm putting a little emphasis in the first one. rut if you're stuck in a rut kind of composing or always coming back to the same patterns similar to what i said earlier find this rudiment so this ratamakue rudiment i've just said um using if i then um limit myself to only using that kind of rhythm i might come up with something interesting <laughs> limited number of notes on because that's one automatic built-in constraint and it's really fun to jam with other people within that constraint but it's also good to put additional limiters on yourself and actually by putting yourself in boxes and getting good you know that was just i'd never played a ratama cube on a handpan before and i was like this is kind of cool um and that's just starting to play around with the different ways that you can take that limitation and put it onto your handpan because all we can do is play one hand or the other hand so finding different ways of putting that together is always really exciting <laughs> <laughs> so you could throw the pan to attack instead of a ratama cube yes you could <laughs> pretty amazing oh well the mouse isn't moving anymore oh yeah this you could throw the pan to attack instead of a rat <laughs> i love that cool okay so some other questions that i got in someone said what's your favorite hand pan <laughs> um which is i think it's an interesting question it's a hard question i know that my i guess the hand pan that i use the most my personal favorite hand pan um has to be this one from celestial sound it's an isabai um, and I love it. It's just so versatile because it's, you know, having all these underneath notes is really useful. But I, I guess it, there's also a question of like choosing a hand pan. What are you going to use that hand pan for? Uh, so using, I, I'm using my hand pan a lot to play covers, to play kind of well-known songs, to play kind of classical based music. And for that, I find that that lots of scope is really useful because I can literally play a full a full major scale um whereas other people who want to play in perhaps a more like meditative style will prefer in in a scale that has more repetition fewer different notes in it so something like a pygmy means that you can play it will have lots of the same note lots of ease on it and I think that's really nice as well. Like uh, yesterday we had a really nice jam, a nice, really nice kind of major pentatonic jam, which will be coming to your screens at some point in the future. Um, and again, yeah, I guess if there was a theme to this whole like lesson conversation, it's been like a lot around limitations. So 
this handpan has all of the notes of a diatonic scale, so seven different pitches on it, and repeated multiple times. So in a way that's not very limited, that gives me a lot of scope, which then means that I'm making a lot of choices. It means that I can, you know, accidentally hit some, some very clashy notes that don't fit together. Um, it means I have to be quite conscious in like finding the scales across the pan. They're not laid out beside each other often. So that means I'm making a lot of choices. Um, whereas there's, there's other t settings in which I wanna play something that's got fewer options. It's more limited in that way, it's more repetitive. It gives me time to zone in to maybe think about the timbre of the way that I'm playing, the, the sounds that are coming out, the shapes of those chords. So I, uh, for the first time pan I had, actually the first time pan I had was an F equinox, so an F minor pentatonic. Uh, and that was great because it meant that within that confine, I could learn a lot about the sounds of the handpan, making different techniques. How does it sound if I use my thumb? How does it sound if I'm hitting it here versus here versus here versus here versus here? Mm -hmm. um, and learn about those different kind of handpan centric things in that setting. Then the next instrument I got was a D curd. Um, and that's really common. There's a lot of uh, people that play D curds. There's a lot of tutorials on D curds. Um, and that was really useful. As well so i guess this was the first instrument that i kind of like really once i knew a bit more about handpan playing i selected that one and then from there and it was also it's also like so i guess i have an affinity to that in that way but as i've continued going and growing and learning and meeting different instruments I, they're all they, they all have something to teach you like they all have something to offer you so yeah let me know if you have a handpan and what scale your handpan is and why you chose it because i think that's really interesting as well i've been doing a few different uh like like getting to know your handpan type videos so i think it would be great to know what scales people might like uh yeah are there any other questions any other burning wonderings or thoughts this has been really fun i'll check if we got any other questions uh yeah, I think that was most of the questions that we had. I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> um, oh yeah, someone was saying about, um, I, I actually kind of answered this, but thinking about sitting or standing. <laughs> I love my D-curd, but it doesn't have enough notes. <laughs> no, Sue, this video is all about limitations and putting good boundaries on yourself. <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean to be fair, like don't even get me started on the underneath notes as well. That's another thing. Like students often come to me and they're like, "Oh, should I get this? Like, I've never played the handpan before. Should I get this instrument with like forty-seven notes on it? It only costs me like a hundred pounds." I'm like, "No, it's going to be a terrible instrument, or even it's going to be an amazing instrument." You know, you want to make sure that you're into it first. <laughs> I'm used to my piano. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. But then those limitations become part become part of your music, and you know, so you have a D curd. I'm not sure if you have plus eight or plus nine around the top. But then you're here, and you think, okay, I want to make my F chord. Let's say chord three. This pan has a low F, so I have that option to make it sound, you know lower from the F, from that rooted F. If you only have these notes, how can I make that note, which is the highest, feel the most grounded, the most central? And then you get to challenge yourself, you get to use dynamics. So if I play them all the same volume, this is the lowest note, this is the one that really like resonates out. If I just maybe let my hand fall naturally how it might, just given the position, given the angle of this, this finger, has a lot more leverage to play loudly than this thumb, which is using a kind of rotation. So if I play this in the most natural way for my hand, this note is gonna be the loudest note and it's gonna ring through. But I don't want that. I want my chord to be super balanced. I want that this note to be the most, the loudest, I guess, the most important. So I now have to speak to my left hand, ask it to play a little bit louder, a little bit weightier, um, play into the instrument a little bit more to get that chord sounding super balanced and sounding maybe, yeah, more like your piano. If I have this option, 
you know, I'm not learning that skill because there might be other moments where for whatever reason, I do need to have this note louder. So I think learning your instrument or learning the instruments that you have is so, so, so important and useful and such a good, like, useful skill. And especially all these instruments are all kind of different. They're made by different makers. They might be made in different ways. But getting really good on an instrument that is more difficult to play means that when you do come and play a super resonant one like the Meridian, you know, and now I already have that like kind of stronger technique that now I just get the get to sit and let it bloom and blossom, which is a treat as well, a different kind of treat. So yeah, I think getting really good, getting, I would definitely advise people to get really good with the instrument they have before they get another instrument. Because often it's like, oh, I'm not progressing, you know, people who, people might want to try and get a new instrument to progress further on that. But actually, suddenly, I find it still, I still find it difficult getting between, going between this, you know, E sub I and on the D curd, because suddenly where I think of my chord one is, <laughs> makes a like completely different sound than I thought it might, you know? So because your brain always takes a second to switch in performances, I find I often want to just, <laughs> before I'll go into my piece, just to remind myself of where those notes are. Um, so yeah, and that will help you as well. The more that you know your instrument, your D curds, or, or whatever you have, to to get your covers in, it helps you to jam. It helps you to noodle. You want to know broadly what notes are going to come out when you're playing, and the only way you can do that is by learning the way that your hand pan sounds. So yeah, get good at your pan before you even think about another pan. And get good is a is a broad term that can mean whatever it means, but. Uh, yeah, those itchy fingers to get a new pan. Hold off for a little while and keep it going. Oh, yes, yeah, so I was just going to briefly touch on someone spoke about sitting and about posture. Um, yeah, I think there's there's so many different ways that we all have such different bodies. There's so many different ways to sit. Um, it's important that you feel comfortable, basically. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sitting up like ramrod straight, like doing a kind of sergeant major soldier thing having a little bit of a bend and, and but the, you want to have a really relaxed body and I often sort of talk about this idea of a droplet of water uh like you don't want any like really extreme like robot arms <laughs> I also teach children um but you don't want any kind of like extreme edges so I love the idea of like a droplet of water just like rolling down your body and um, so that's a kind of a gentle a really like a gentle curve uh, chicken wings maybe not but we're just kind of having this relaxed so that where, wherever you are on this pan your hands have a little bit of a, a little bit of bend to them um but yeah it does all start with your feet so whether you're sitting cross-legged or in a chair as i am finding that kind of groundedness finding as much connection sometimes i do find myself playing up like on my tippy toes because i like the pan to be reasonably flat uh but again, this comes back to, oh my gosh, it's all coming together. If you do do that warm up, if you do do those techniques, those grounding techniques at the beginning of your practice session, it means that you will be more connected and you will be playing and you won't be kind of bedding in any really weird, un unhappy techniques. I mean, sure, sometimes if I'm playing, you know, these notes, I've got to move a bit unnaturally. It is an unnatural thing to get our hands to do all bits and bobs. Um, but it, it's just making sure that it feels comfortable because we want to keep playing for a long time. And we want to feel super happy and healthy in our bodies. Uh, and yeah, stretching and moving around is really going to help too. Awesome. Right. This is, this is a bit of an experiment. This is the first time I've done a bit of a live lesson like this. I really wanted to do it because I thought it would be fun and I was right. <laughs> Thank you so much for all being here and for popping in. I think I'm um, keep an eye out. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and all of that stuff, because I think I may do another one in the future at some point. I'll collect in a few more questions and, and talk again, because it's really nice. It's really nice to have this like personal connection with you all. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for being here. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel and the rest of that and keep on playing, practicing and putting limitations on yourself. <laughs> 
just an inspiring, <laughs> inspiring suggestion. Live it yourself. And yeah, let me know. Like if you if you make a piece or something, even just a short piece. Okay, yeah, the takeaway is from this chat. Put some limitations on yourself. And then I really do challenge you to share something, even if it's a snippet, even if it's your phone stood up and balanced. I started recording with my phone balanced on a stack of books, like, and it kept falling off because, like, duh. So start off totally like that and just make a little recording with the audio as good as you can. And, yeah, find let's find some safe places to share it. So whether that's in this group that I mentioned, the Handpan Fundamentals group, uh, or it's, it's on your... Instagram or whatever, just putting a tag in um, and just to really start getting up because it can't be something that only people who are practiced at performing, they can't be the only people that share their work because then no one else is going to get practice, no one else is going to get sharing their work. So I'm really, really encouraging people. I want a bit of a performance push at the moment because I think that just taking that 30 seconds and sharing 30 seconds, will you will gain so much from that experience. And yes, playing in your room is amazing. And yes, playing by yourself is so important. But also taking that bravery and sharing it is only inspiring to other people. And then we all get to be handpan players together, even though we're in different places of the world. So yeah, stay in touch and have a lovely Monday. Bye.